Um, at least generally, any state of specific questions, I might have them come to office hours, but we'll I'll generally talk about what I was looking for with the answers for everything. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how that will Now, hopefully, it's also fresh enough in your head that you remember what you were thinking when you wrote down. You wrote down. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I created some of the more subjective things. So for um, for the vocab, there was, there was like certain certain things I was looking for in the definitions, um, but they weren't sort of really hard lines. So basically, for element, I was looking for some to get full credit. I wanted to see some mention of. Um, being, that being defined by the number of protons. Um, and then for neutron, I, I was looking for two out of the three. The three main qualities of a, of a neutron are that it's neutral, that it's in the nucleus, and that it has mass. And I was looking for two out of the three. You got two out of the three, you got full credit for that one. Um, if you didn't, then that was minus half a point, you got one out of the three. Um, depending on, on how well written it was. Um, for orbital, the only full credit answers for orbital had to have some mention of probability or likelihood, not just like a location or an area where you will find a, an electron, because it's really it's an area where technically, we're being really picky, um, it's a volume, not an area, but I, wasn't, I didn't get that granular with creating it. Um, but it's a volume where you are likely to find an electron, not where you will find an electron. So there's always a small probability that it's not in that shape. Um, so I was looking for some description of probability for that one. Um, and for electron affinity, a lot of you gave me really good definitions for electronegativity. Remember, electron affinity specifically is an amount of energy. So I was looking for some mention of energy, not just how easy it is or how much it wants to gain an electron. Those were one and a half points out of the two points for those. But the full credit, I wanted some mention of energy. And then the main thing I was looking for for compound was did you say specifically that it's two or more elements? If you said two or more atoms, that's not, that wasn't a good enough answer because two or more atoms can still be a, a diatomic element like chlorine, Cl2, is not a compound even though it's a molecule made of two atoms, it's, it's still an element. So um, that's what I was, I was looking for in those ones. Um, this, the uh, the sig figs and units, most everybody did pretty well, although the temperature one, as usual, is where I saw the most, most mistakes. It should have gone to the tenth place um, for the temperature one at the bottom, and it should have ended up in Fahrenheit at the end. So you actually gain the sig fix because it had that addition term in it after you multiply. Um, on the nomenclature, um, and again, pretty fairly straightforward. If you could identify, you know, whether it's ionic or covalent, that can told you whether you were supposed to look at. Um, and use those prefixes if it was a covalent compound versus using just the charges to determine the formula um, if it was ionic. Um, a couple people randomly used the old school style of naming things that I specifically said don't use that, um, like cupric oxide, um, actually sort of like cuprous oxide or 
nitrous oxide for N2O. Um, those are, while you may have used the term correctly, that's specifically the way I said don't do nomenclature. So you still got marked down, even if you wrote the right name, if you use the old school name, I still marked you down because that's, I don't want to teach you bad habits. I don't want to teach you the old way of doing things. I want to teach you the new standard. Um, and then the other most common, the, the most common mistake though, is with those Roman numerals, people got confused or stressed out and thought the Roman numerals had something with how many of something you had rather than the charge. So for iron two phosphide, a lot of people wrote Fe2P when a lot of people wrote FEP2. Um, again, that's I'm used to seeing that, but we can do better than that. Just it's getting used to, right? So those Roman numerals in the parentheses specifically are the charge on the metal. Any questions about the first three so far? If it's something specific to points that you got from seeing in office hours, or if there's some general thing about, I don't know, you know, I don't understand why you did it like this and not like that, then um, be happy to answer any of those. Um, and I'm also happy that just about everybody took my advice and got their easy points on counting protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, the class average on that problem was like was above a nine, I want to say, um, which is pretty good. Um, the most common mistakes with people mixing up neutrons and electrons, or thinking that electrons relative to neutrons was defined by the charge, which is an easy mistake to make when you're going fast, right? You put um, something that has the same number of neutrons and electrons is neutral, when really it should be the same number of protons and electrons if it's neutral, right? So there were a number of people that did similar things to that, and I tried not to be too harsh on those, um, even though you might have gotten, you know, eight out of the 12 wrong, technically, by doing that. Um, I tried to be generous with that and try to understand. If I could see where you made the mistake in your thinking, that allowed me to give some partial credit to that. Um, conversions. Again, the most common thing was sig figs, um, which is Again, pretty standard, especially on the temperature conversion. Everybody wanted to keep it to three sig figs, um, but it really should have stayed going to the tenth place. So it should have been 310.1 Kelvin, not just 310, and not keeping all five deaths are sig figs. Um, a lot of people wrote down the 310.14. But again, I'm used to that. And as long as you're trying your best, sig figs shouldn't get you missing that quarter of a point here or there on sig figs not going to be what makes a difference between an A and a B in this class, as long as you're consistently trying to, to do it, but following the right rules. Um, and then a lot of people had calculator issues or issues figuring out what to cube where for the volume one. Um, just a reminder that if your conversion has, has a volume in it, like, 10 to the third cubic centimeters equals one liter. We don't need to cube this because it already has a cubic unit in it. Right? And same goes for, I saw a number of people on number 10, the area where you had to convert area in square centimeters to square meters. You, there was a squared conversion in there and a lot of people squared the 2.5. It was 2.5 centimeters squared. And then people want to convert that to meters squared. So they would say, 10 to the 2 centimeters is 1 meter. A lot of people either forgot to square this or they squared this too. If you, had, if you wound up with an area that started with a 6 instead of 2.5 or something, then you squared this number when you shouldn't have. Because right? 2.5 squared is 6.25, I believe. So you would have wound up with an, an answer to the top. So if you got that number, that means if you squared something you shouldn't have, and if you got that the area of the leaf was 0.25 square meters, then you didn't square this, even if you wrote it as being squared. All right. So again, I see that a lot of that a lot of this is remembering how to use your calculator when you're in a stressful situation. Um, but I'm just reminding everybody how that all works. 
Um, any, offhand, does anybody know what the number in B is on the conversion sheet or the conversion problem? 343.2 meters per second. It is 767.7 miles per hour. I, I was asking more about what if, uh, if anybody knew why that number was significant. That speed of sound, speed of sound at sea level. No, you also were pointing out what the answer was here. Um, and interestingly enough, somebody left it in in uh, miles per second. They forgot forgot to convert the hours in, or the seconds into hours. Um, and if you do that, you get an answer that's about 0.21 miles per second. Um, so does everybody everybody remembers learning the old trick when you were a kid of figuring out how far away the lightning storm is by counting between between light and thunder? How did everybody else learn it? How, how do you how do you take counting and turn it into a distance? For that anybody remember? Every second that goes by, every like however many miles away it is, or like that's the way I remember being taught. That's actually wrong, though. It's about every five seconds is one mile away. Because if you convert speed of sound into miles per second, you get about 0 0.2. So it takes about five seconds to get one mile at speed of sound. So just interesting side note because I learned it as. You know, however many seconds that's how many miles it is, but it's every time, every five seconds, it's one mile. Um, for the atomic mass, everybody did pretty well on that, except the number one mistake people made was they forgot to put the percent abundance into a decimal and they put it in as a percentage instead, um, which means you got an answer instead of being 12, something close to 12 AMU, you got something more like. 1200 AMU because you are missing it divided by 100 in there somewhere. Um, so, again, that was since this is a fairly quick calculation, it's a little bit more of a, a ding than normal, but that was about, I think the standard was two and a half points out of 10 off if you forgot to do that. So, that's kind of a significant part of that calculation. Um, Anything else specifically? And then it should have gone to five sig figs. And it's hard to see why unless you do it in separate steps. Do the multiplication before you do the division. And you should have wound up with the first term. Uh, two of the terms had four sig figs, and one of the terms had five sig figs, but the lowest or the most uncertainty was in the thousandth place. So your answer should have gone to the thousandth place. Um, so 12.190, not 12.19, and not 12.1904, I think was the, the next digit. And again, that's a half point deduction, not that critical, but um, worth paying attention to. Uh, no, our electron configurations. Sorry, any, any questions about those last two pages? Okay. The number one mistakes that people made on number seven were um, forgetting what the charge on an indium ion is or not realizing it's supposed to be an ion. So I guess actually let's start with, I'll write it. We'll do that on the board. So on the recording. So in DMs, electron configuration, if you're writing it out all the way, would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, and all of that just gets us to Krypton, right? And then we go 5s2, 4d10. I just barely ran myself out of room. And the last one would be a 5P1. So if I'm writing that in a more condensed form, it would be Krypton followed by 5S2, 4D10, 5P1. That's for indium when it's neutral. When indium is an ion, 
it's a plus three charge because it's got three valence electrons it can lose. So indium with a plus three charge would be just krypton 4d10. <clears throat> Those ones are the, the electrons that get lost. And so a lot of people just took one electron away. They only took that 5p electron away and, and wrote the electron configuration for indium with a plus one charge. But that's not a stable ion. Indium will only ever have a plus three charge. Um, so this is what I was looking for. And then a number of people left it like this, just treated it like it was neutral. That's normal. You just mis misread it or forgot to take the electrons away. And only a, only a few people tried to break up the 4D orbital, which is good, right? Fold the orbitals, we never want to break those up. Um, periodic trends, number eight. The biggest curveball, probably the biggest curveball in the whole test is that I threw an electron affinity question in there, um, as opposed to adding both of C and D ionization energy. Um, so you had to think about electron affinity rather than ionization energy. And that there was a noble gas involved, right? So neon should have the lowest electron affinity because it's already got full um, valence, right? It doesn't want to gain or lose electrons. Um, and fluorine is going to have the highest electron affinity because it wants to gain an electron more than silicon. Gaining one electron is a much bigger deal for fluorine than gaining one electron if you're silicon. <coughs> And then the other thing that um, people missed on the one right above that on C um, was if we're talking about was it sodium, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum. If you just go by the general trends for ionization energy, you would say, well, ionization energy increases as you go left to right. But remember that there's an issue with having a full orbital causes those little sati on our, on our chart, right? And magnesium has a full, so it's what, is it two or it's three, huh? Three S, sodium looks like this. Magnesium looks like this, and aluminum looks like this. So sodium is the easiest to take that electron away, so it has the lowest ionization energy. Most people just went lowest, middle, highest. But aluminum is actually easier to take an electron away from than magnesium because it's got this electron all by, it, all by itself right there. So that electron is easier to take away than it is to break up that full 3s orbital that magnesium has. Questions on periodic trends? So the most difficult one would be magnesium. So magnesium is the hardest one to take an electron away for because you have the highest ionization energy. Um, as far as molecular geometries and Lewis dot structures goes, we still have some work to do on that, but that's normal. That was the last topic we added, and we're going to keep practicing with it um, and keep working with Vesper geometries and picturing them in 3D and everything. Um, probably the single trickiest question on this one was, um, as far as the Lewis dot structure goes, was the sulfur dioxide. Because you can draw a Lewis dot structure that's valid that looks like looks like this. Actually, need to 
So this is a valid Lewis dot structure, but it's not the best Lewis dot structure, right? Because sulfur has a, a um, formal charge of plus one and this oxygen has a formal charge of minus one. So this is one of those cases where we can get the oxygen to share the oxygen with a formal charge of negative one. You can think of it having a formal charge of negative one is having too many electrons, right? It's, it needs to make one more bond or it needs to share one more pair of electrons to become more stable. And we can think of a formal charge of plus one as meaning it needs to, it's missing electrons relative to what it would have if it was most stable. So if you get a plus one right next to a minus one, easiest thing to do is do that. That's the most correct Lewis dot structure. Um, and like I said, I didn't, if you got to a valid Lewis dot structure, if you didn't figure out to break the octet rule on this one, that was only a minus a quarter of a point. Um, on that one, but this is the best answer. And if I look, if you look down at the very bottom, the other common mistake is people thought, I don't know, I, I won't try to pretend to understand how everybody thinks, because everybody thinks differently. Um, but a lot of people on the bottom one, on SO3 with a negative two charge, give me this. And then some people, let's see, and then we want to have all of our lone pairs drawn as well for this. That's not a valid Lewis. It's, it's not the most stable Lewis dot structure because we actually have too many electrons around the sulfur now. Right, so only one of these oxygens should have had a double bond. The other thing I will say that, that I saw is that people forgot to erase a lone pair when they make a double bond sometimes. So let me. So this was the best Lewis dot structure if you ignore the, the third lone pair over here. That was the best Lewis dot structure for number for D. Um, if you did this, I was a little bit harsh with the, with taking away points because the number one rule is you can't break the octet rule if it's in the second row of the periodic table. So likely people just forgot to erase one when they made the double bonds. But anytime you see something with 10 electrons around it, it's on the second row of the periodic table, huge red flag. Um, and it'll be a bigger deal when you get to OCAM because everything is based on around carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen are in the second row of the periodic table. So everything is limited to six to eight electrons. And the, the fastest way to put your instructor into a bad mood in organic chemistry is to draw a carbon with five bonds because you absolutely cannot have more than eight electrons around a carbon. Um, it's again, it's a really common mistake, but that is like the cardinal sin in organic chemistry is drawing something with 10 electrons around it. Um, because almost never do we deal with anything like sulfur that has uh, the Briggs shock tet rule. Any questions on the stock structures or geometries? And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised at how many people got close to the right answer, at least on number 10. Um, the, the main, yeah, the biggest trick, if you're given a wavelength or told to assume a wavelength and you're doing something with counting photons, you can be pretty sure we need to figure out how many joules there are per photon, right? So most of you figured out you were going to be using that that um, uh, energy equation, and I'm just going to write the combined form, but the, it's on the equation sheet and as two different equations, right? Um, energy equals h times frequency, and then speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency.
or you can combine them and get energy equals HC over lambda by just solving for frequency and substituting it in. Um, a lot of people may mess up the conversion from nanometers to meters. They went the wrong way with it. Um, so if you get something like your wavelength was, was 10 to the 11th meters, when you started in nanometers, that's probably a red flag. Just on the reasonableness check, that's that's too big of a number. Um, and then a lot of calculator issues, people forgetting to put that, that uh, term on the bottom in um, parentheses. You wound up with some number that wound up being way too high because you didn't divide by, or way too low because you didn't divide by 10 to the minus seven at the bottom. Um, so if you plug that in, plug in everything with your wavelength in nanometers, you got energy of 3.87, 10 to the minus 19 joules, and that's for one photon, All right? So part of the trick was knowing that this energy is solving for the energy of a single photon. So if we know that, now we know energy per photon, that's a conversion you can write. One photon equals this many joules. So all you, can, you, all you have to do beyond that, you can set the entire rest of this problem up as one long conversion. It's not even that long. It's just a little bit tricky to see where it's going until you have done it once. So here's the conversion people forgot to square. People put in 100 centimeters as one meter, but then it's square centimeters. We gotta square, do that twice. And now we're in square meters, and then we can use that number that's provided, that joules per square meter, right? We can say, okay, and a lot of people stopped there and just got an area for the leaf in square meters, and that's fine too. You can break this up however you want. Um, the math should be pretty similar. Once you have square meters, you can say, well, one square meter is 10 to the three joules. And then we can say this number, 3.87, 10 to the minus nine joules is one photon. Centimeters squared canceled out centimeters squared, meters squared canceled out meters squared, joules canceled out joules, and we're left in photons. And if you did all of that right, got something like 6.46. Depending on where you rounded, your answer might have been slightly different. 10 to the 17 photons. If you got this coefficient or 6.4 something, but your, your power was off, you probably messed up your conversion, um, either your conversion from nanometers to meters or your conversion from square centimeters to square meters. If you, those are the two even powers of 10 that we, that we had in here, or it's possible you just forgot to include this term, but I think, if, uh, I don't think anybody forgot to use this um, equation. Um, if you're off by a factor of 10 to the nine, if you got something times 10 to the 28, then that's, that was your conversion from nanometers to meters that was off. If you got something that was just off by a factor of a hundred, it's this one. All right, and so I, you know, even if you didn't get really anywhere close to a final solution, if you started converting from nanometers to meters or you wrote down those equations, even though you didn't know what you were going to do with them, I at least was able to give people a couple of points, even if it, it seems pretty clear that you were you were lost or ran out of time. Um, that's again, that's normal. That's what this question is there for, um, because it's the those first many points you knew exactly what to expect with a couple of minor variations. And this was just that last push to see um, who, who can think on their feet, really. Any questions about the 
wild card or any of it at this point. All right, and so I also, like I said, I'll put in these scores later. I will also remind everybody um, not to panic if you got a score that's less than what you wanted, because this one, the course is designed so that it's more, much more heavily weighted towards the weekly quizzes and turning into your assignments. You can do those things. You can still you can still pass the class and never get above a sixty on a test. Um, if you get everything turned in and you do your weekly quizzes. Um, and the other nice thing, um, nice is relative, um, but it can be helpful to actually have a midterm score that's a little bit less than what you wanted, because that means all you have to do to bring your grade up at the end of the term is do better than you did on this test. Because right now you only have one score in your exams category, right? So, you know, let's say you got a, a 65% on this. That's your entire exam score is 65%, right? So right now, this midterm is sitting at 30% of your total grade. But really, as soon as we take another test, put it into that category, as long as you get a 70% on the next one, that'll still bring up your total grade because your exam grade will go from 65% to 67.5, right? So all you have to do to improve your, your overall numerical grade is better on the next test than you did on this one. And if you manage to get a 98 on this test and then um, don't turn anything in and you wind up sitting at like a 90%, right, going into the final, um, and you have a 98%, that means you got to do better than a 98% on final to bring your grade or to keep your grade at that 90%, right? So it works both ways. You did really well on this one. you got to do just as well on the next one to keep your grade where it is. But if you did poorly on this one, you just have to do better than what you did so far on the next test. Ron? Oh, never mind. Okay. All right. And since this is the time when everybody starts looking at their grade, you now that you have something in all the categories, um, I will also point out that that Canvas already has your lowest quiz and your lowest assignment grade dropped. And you're not going to get a sudden boost at the end um, by me dropping things at the very last second. It's already has your lowest score in those two categories dropped. Um, so don't be waiting on getting up, you know, a 2% push because you get one assignment drop, that's already factored in, just so everybody's aware. And then average-wise, average and median are relatively close together. Median's about right where I want it. Um, this distribution is pretty standard, and it's about what um, what they, the test's supposed to do. Um, Q1 is the means first quartile meaning that 25% um, of the total grades in, on this assignment, 25% were, were below a 72.5, 25% were between 72.5 and 80.5, 25% was between the median and the third quartile. So basically we had a quarter of the class got between a 70, 72 and an 80, a quarter of the class between an 80 and a 90 and a quarter of the class between the 90 and the 98. So pretty evenly spread out. Those are nice nice chunks, about 10 points in between each of those. Which means the distribution is about what it's, it's supposed to look like. Um, and overall, um, everybody did, did pretty well. So any great questions? General great questions. I don't want to hear about your half a point that should have been a, a quarter of a point deduction. Come see me office hours. I'll be happy to fix that. Are we doing string in packet assignments tests or is it just the RGN? The practice test? Yeah. Um, either either online or you can give them to me today on paper. Um, either way. Yeah. So those those last assignments from last week, the uh, Vesper Lab and the um, Practice them. We haven't turned them in yet. Turn them in today, either digitally or, or uh, on paper. All right. 
we're going to be switching gears right off the bat and we're sitting at 140 already so let's take our 10 minute break a little bit early today let's come back at 10 till and then we'll do lecture after that all right we'll start lecture at 10 10 to 2 and 150. Um, because you nice. Yeah. I have to be able to know where everything came from. So if you don't believe in your balance, let's go. I know you have some music, but you're going to be able to respond to it. All right. I know it's crazy. I know it's kind of crazy, but I know that you had the issue with some other spots, too, but I wasn't as picky. So it's really two points for the whole cast for every time you don't do that. Yeah, yeah, I know it takes a lot longer to do that. But it lets me remember the goal is not just that I can tell the students anybody's students can get all their work. Yeah, that's not I just look at it and say, oh, well, I know that that's not okay. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta give yourself at least a half an hour. Oh, it's fine. It happens. It Well, thank you. No problem. You did good. Trying to see the ingredients in the core, right? I can still draw if I need to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know me. You're fine. Okay, I know. You're good. Yeah. You know, like, like that's, that, that score for me is pretty bad. Yes. But remember the rest of the class yeah. is designed around it. And I keep doing more practice in the releases. And part of it might just be the casing. Um, make sure that you don't have any any big spots where you didn't work able to spend that time. Mm -hmm. So I might want to talk to um, student accommodations to make them easier to come. You know, quick test to see if you if you need extra time on tests. They can start to document that. And, and if, you, um, if, if you felt that there was a, a, a huge amount of time pressure and you weren't able to even look at some of the questions that you wanted to, um, that would be something I would suggest too, because having an extra hour would have made a big difference for you. Then that's something you should probably go talk to them. They might. Best you can say no, you're you're okay, and we just need to work on your on your casing. Okay. Um, but they might also say no, you, can, you know you'll get you're qualified to get an extra hour or an extra two hours. Where did the like Where did like if I don't edit and change your computer And as soon as I put in the source, okay. it'll it'll show you what it looks like right now. Uh -huh. um, and. And this is actually just a PSA as well. I think Friday is the last day of withdrawal. I don't think anybody's did did uh, so poorly that that they're in danger of not passing if they continue on. But if you know you're you're used to getting your GPAs, you know, close to four zero, and you're looking to get in C in here, um, if you know if you've got other stuff going on in your life that you're not going to be able to dedicate the time you need to this class, you do still have to end it tomorrow to to withdraw. <laughs> Again, I don't think anybody needs to, but if you're thinking you might be in that category, come talk to me and we'll talk it through and all and uh, see what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, just step right over there. Okay. 
question that, that would work. That you can kind of see that it's big, you know, into the paper and out of the paper is the Pentagon, and then what happened went down. That was good. Okay. <laughs> So, if you, so it, it wouldn't be on the cathedral because everything's still going to be in the same spot as it is. Um, because six wanting to meet basically one of the spots, either one of the Pentagon points or one of the up or down, are going to be replaced with a military. And so we don't really have a name for that per se. Um, but, but if you think about which which possibilities there are. So we have we have things at, at each of these points, one of them. So just just like before, you don't when you added a bone pair on the um by perennial, there were two there's A versus B positions, right? And it only ever goes to the B position because that U is near nearest neighbors. We have the same thing here, right? The points of the Pentagon are all identical to each other, but they're different than the ones sticking up and down. So the points of the Pentagon, this bond angle. Is going to be about 72 degrees yeah. versus each of these is going to be 90 degrees, right? Over yeah. Right. And so then we wind up with a shape and molecular geometry that looks like this looks like a pentagon with a point sticking straight up, right? So if you, if you use similar names to what we've already done, if we did this with an octahedral geometry, it became square planar, right? Yeah. Or sorry, square pyramidal. <laughs> if we get it with a straight on bipyramidal, we got a seesaw. But um, what would be what would the shape? How would you describe the shape? It's one of the daughter line back behind you. So if you think about what this is going to look like. Six sides, six like six sides of five. Six sides of five. So pentagonal, pentagonal pyramid might be a way to describe that, or you can just draw it. Okay, we're just trying to draw it. Yeah, just two times. Yeah. And then we'll see. Um, it's actually mm -hmm. it's just confusing. So it's the round square here, like this. Oh, maybe I, it's because I can you see it again? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure why. No, you're you're right. That is a. Um, I didn't take into account that you sent it to the rest of by a thousand. Uh, because this divided by 10,000 should be 0. 0. Uh, Where divided by 10? Yeah, so no, you, you are, did that part right. I was just not looking for a square meters, not But yeah. Thank you. I know that they think we were all. Oh, I don't remember, but they think that you're all. Thank you. 
All right, break is drawing to a close. If you want anybody who's here and ready to start paying attention, they start working on, do some more practice with formal charge. All right, so I'm going to start working through Lewis soft structures for this ion. Um, you start by just counting everything up. Chlorine is a halogen, right? Column 17. So it's going to bring seven valence electrons. Each oxygen brings six valence electrons. And we have three of them. And we've got a negative one charge, which means we get one extra electron. So that gives us 26 electrons total. Out of chlorine and oxygen, what are we going to put in the middle? Chlorine. Chlorine. And why? It's just barely more like the negative. And we know oxygen can't make as many bonds as chlorine as well, because chlorine is in that third row of the periodic table, right? So chlor putting chlorine in the middle gives us the opportunity to break that octet rule if that's going to give us lower formal charges or formal charges close to zero. So even though we normally think of chlorine as having fewer vacancies than oxygen, in this case, we're going to put chlorine in the middle. And then put the oxygens around it. Used six electrons, so now we're down to 20 electrons left. How many does each oxygen still need? Two. Six more, so that's going to use up 18 of our 20, right? Mm -hmm. Two electrons left. We know where they have to go, right? They've got to go on chlorine. Chlorine doesn't have eight electrons left, plus the oxygens already have eight, so we can't give them the oxygen. So that satisfies two of our criteria, right? Right number of electrons, and everything has a full valence. But this is one of those cases where we're going to have an opportunity to make an even better one by getting those formal charges closer to zero, right? So what's the formal charge for chlorine the way it's drawn right now? Two plus. Two plus, good. 
right? Chlorine owns, quote unquote, five electrons. The lone pair counts for two. And then there's six electrons that are shared that we count half of. So that's a total of five electrons owned for the chlorine and it has seven on the periodic table when it's neutral, right? So that means that the chlorine is plus two and each oxygen is what currently? Minus? Three. There's a total of minus three if you counted all of the oxygens. Each of them individually is going to be minus one. Right, because each oxygen has seven electrons and it has six when it's on the periodic table when it's neutral. So we can get get some of these closer to zero by forcing the oxygen to share a little bit more. But don't you want an overall charge of minus one? Yes, and we have an overall charge of minus one, right? which means that we calculated all of our formal charges properly and we used the right number of electrons, but we want it to add up to minus one. We also want as many of these to be zero as possible. And if we do it right, it will still add up to an overall negative one charge. So if we start by taking one of these pairs and turning it into a double bond, now this oxygen is now zero. And that took the chlorine from being a plus two to a plus one, exactly. So it still has an overall net charge of negative one, right? So we can do that one more time. By doing that, now that gives this oxygen a formal charge of zero, and that takes the chlorine from being plus one to also being zero. So if you move the electrons around right, it will still add up to a net charge of negative one every time. But this is a more stable arrangement for the electrons because we have more atoms with a formal charge of zero. The more atoms we can keep with a formal charge of zero, the better, the more stable that system is. All right, so what would the, the Vesper geometry look like for this one? How many electron domains do we have? Four. Four? So the electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral and the molecular geometry is going to be trigonal pyramidal, not planar. Just because we can't see the lone pair doesn't mean everything else gets to flatten out and be trigonal planar. It's still there taking up space, forcing it to be that pyramid shape. Right. So drawing it in three dimensions, we would have something that looks like if we're drawing the electron geometry with the lone pair, We have something like this. Let me clean this up. And, and actually now that, oh man. It's okay, I was gonna move one of those anyway. The lone pair that I didn't draw again, it's still sitting here pushing it. So it's not flat. It's again, this is one of the trickiest things is when I, when you switch from talking about electron geometry to molecular geometry, the electron geometry is still there. It still has that shape. The molecular geometry just means we can't see whatever it is that's taking up space here. Um, one of the ways that you can think about it at, is if you have, um, if you look at a bunch of kids sitting on a school bus from the front of the bus 
that every every kid probably has a backpack too, right? If you've got if nobody is sitting in the same sheet, same seat, you could probably assume that there's something taking up space that you can't see next to each of those kids, right? The, the back, their backpacks on the seat next to them are taking up space, even though you can't observe it. You can observe the effect because you can see nobody sitting next to each other, right? So that's the same logic fish as what we see here that lone pair is taking up space but we can't see it so it's not going to just flatten out and become trigonal planar it still has four electron domains just only three of them are visible all right let's look at the next one hno3 how many valence electrons do we have to work with Twenty-four, so six from each of the oxygens. So six times three is eighteen. Plus five from the nitrogen is twenty-three. Plus one from the hydrogen gives us twenty-four electrons to work with. What's going to go in the middle? Nitrogen. Nitrogen is less electronegative and um, than oxygen, and we can never put hydrogen in the middle. So then, what do I do with the oxygens and the hydrogens? Spread them out around, right? So that used eight. So now we're down to 16 electrons left. How many electrons does each oxygen still need? Six. Six. And there's three oxygens. We don't have 18 electrons though. Means we're going to have to do something with a double bond. So now we're out of electrons. How can we make a double bond that's going to fill up that oxygen valence? This, this nitrogen doesn't have any electrons it can share. That aren't already part of the bond, right? So what's going on there? How do we oxygens? Oxygens what? Well, but you can't make a double bond from this oxygen to that oxygen. So basically, when you run into a situation like this. That's a red flag that maybe this isn't the best way to arrange the atoms. This is the first time we've seen a case where we can't just put everything around a central atom. So take the hydrogen and remove it? Yeah, what if we took the hydrogen and we removed it? Let's just, and let's leave the nitrogen's electrons and just turn them into a lone pair. Would that be good? Now we could that we could make a double bond to fill that oxygen, right? But now we also have, now we have the hydrogen with no electrons and it needs to go somewhere and have a full valence. How's that gonna work? Well, we can't add another lone pair. One, because we're out of electrons, and two, because nitrogen already has eight electrons. We could attach it to an oxygen. The hydrogen that we're going to add on doesn't have any electrons with it, right? We already used all of our electrons. What if we stuck it right there? Turn that lone pair into a bond. We still have the same number of electrons, right? We're still a total of 24 electrons. And now everything has a full valence, right? But there's a negative charge. There's a negative charge where? The bottom oxygen. The bottom oxygen has a negative one formal charge. And the overall molecule is neutral, right? So if the bottom oxygen has a negative one formal charge, what else is there? 
Nitrogen's got a plus one. That still adds up to zero though, right? Sometimes the best Lewis dot structure we can draw without breaking our rules has formal charges that add up to zero. So this is the right structure for this one. This is one that I wanted to spend some time on. One, because this is a little bit weird in that it's kind of like it has two central atoms, right? Which we haven't seen before. Up to this point, we see one set, one atom goes in the middle, everything else goes around it, right? But in this case, you've got the nitrogen that has three atoms bonded to it. But then we also have this oxygen that has two atoms bonded to it. So this oxygen also is its own sort of central atom. So the, what I want to, to bring up is that sometimes we do have to get creative with the way it's arranged. It's not that everything sticks around a central atom. And the other piece is um, that the name molecular geometry is kind of a misnomer because molecular geometry doesn't describe the geometry of the entire molecule. It's only describing the geometry of one specific atom within a molecule. This nitrogen has its own molecular geometry, which for this nitrogen, the way it's drawn now, what's the geometry around that nitrogen? How many electron domains around the nitrogen? Three. Three. So trigonal planar, any of them lone pairs? No. So it's a trigonal planar nitrogen. How about that oxygen? How many electron domains around that oxygen? Four. So it's tetrahedral electron geometry, which, and two of them are lone pairs, which tells us it's what? Bands. Because remember, they're still taking up space, even though I drew them as being linear. Remember, that this is a tetrahedral shape overall. So it's the oxygen is bent, the nitrogen is trigonal planar. So these, these terms, these Vesper geometries, apply to anything that's got more than, than one atom attached to it, basically. So every, if you get a larger molecule, like we see all the time in biochemistry and organic chemistry, you get a larger molecule, every single carbon, every single oxygen, every single nitrogen is going to have its own electron geometry and its own molecular geometry. And when you, when you put all of those together, you get an overall shape for the entire molecule, right? So one, I, I'm spending time on this because I've had people get hung up before on counting electron domains for, for electron geometries where they would look at this and say, well, the nitrogen's got three and the oxygen's got four, therefore there's seven electron domains. No, we're talking about for one atom specifically when we're counting electron domains, right? So all those lone pairs on, on like the sulfur, sulfur uh, tetrafluoride, all those lone pairs around the fluorine don't affect the sulfur at all in terms of this molecular geometry, right? So that's the point that I'm trying to make here is that these molecular shapes have certain properties. And as we get to more and more complicated systems, the overall geometries are going to have sort of bits and pieces that we can recognize. But it's not going to stay as simple as everything's tetrahedral. Go back to the formal Yeah. Why does it, is that nitrogen is positive and the oxygen is negative? Why does why wouldn't one of the lone pairs make a double bond instead? Because we're limited because nitrogen is in the second row of the periodic table. If this was a phosphorus, which is just one low, one row below nitrogen, right? Phosphorus has a d orbital that even if it doesn't have any electrons in it, its valence shell still has a d orbital. So a phosphorus can break the octet rule, and you could do that. And the best structure for for this, if it was a phosphorus instead of the nitrogen, would have two double bonds to the middle one. But nitrogen, 
already has eight valence electrons and is not allowed to break that because it's in the second energy level. It doesn't have a d orbital to use. <laughs> yeah, anything that's only it's only um, has a bond to one other atom is always going to be linear, right? Because it's always at the end of something. So, but for this oxygen, its electron geometry would be trigonal planar, but its molecular geometry would just be linear because you can only see one of the three things that's attached to. But we can actually observe this happening um, in in uh, biochemistry. If you look at, so if you look at how hemoglobin works, you've got this iron atom that's surrounded by this sort of lattice of nitrogens and carbons that kind of hold the nitrogen in place. And it's basically this flat sheet called a porphyrin ring. And this iron that's in this porphyrin ring um, is called together, it's called a heme group. So that's where hemoglobin gets its name. Um, and this is all in the middle of your hemoglobin um, protein. And the way hemoglobin works is this positive charge is attracted to electrons. And so if you have, say, an oxygen up here or an O2 molecule, the, the electron geometry of O2 is two oxygens that each have a trigonal planar electron geometry, even though it just looks like they're linear, because you can only see one. One of the ways we know that this has to be the actual shape, though, is because if we can actually get an X ray crystallograph of um, what hemoglobin looks like when it's saturated with oxygen. And the second oxygen is sitting off at a 120 degree angle. It sits there. This lone pair forms a bond, more or less, with the iron which means this oxygen has to be at 120 degrees, not 180. Now, if you, if you replace the, the oxygen with carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide's Lewis dot structure looks like this instead. The carbon monoxide bonds to the iron roughly 80 times better than oxygen does, than oxygen gas. So if you have any ox or CO or yeah, CO carbon monoxide around, it should displace the oxygen and just sit there instead. And it binds so well that it doesn't drop off the CO at your muscles the way that it would oxygen just stays stuck to your hemoglobin. Um, the way that evolution has sort of countered this a little bit is, and so the earliest forms of hemoglobin um, was a, there was a molecule called myoglobin that still gets used in our cells for basically holding on to oxygen in our muscles. Um, but myoglobin was the earliest form of a protein used for oxygen transport. Um, and it didn't have this next feature, which is basically the shape of the protein is such that it's got this big chunk that kind of sits right above the hemoglobe group that gets in the way physically. Whatever binds to that iron Binds best if it can be at a 120 degree angle, not at a 180 degree angle. Because if it's at a 180, you wind up with it bumping into this big chunk up here that sits in the way. And there's actually a specific name for what this molecule or what this little section is. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, but basically that's one of the ways that our bodies have evolved to not be so susceptible to carbon monoxide poisoning is it drops the binding affinity difference from, I think in, in myoglobin it's like 200 to one and in, in hemoglobin it's 80 to one. So it improved it. It's almost twice as resistant to carbon monoxide poisoning by having this little loop thing. And it's because of the vesper geometries of CO versus O2 which I always found really fascinating. I loved, I loved taking upper division biochem because you get to study hemoglobin in really a ton of detail and get into a lot of the things like that, um, which is why I know that there's a name for that loop. I think it's more that I cannot come up with it for the life of me right now. All right. And all of that was more than, more than what y'all were asking for, but I think it's cool. So low tangent. Um, all right. 
And I'm glad to, David brought up the why does it make another double bond? Because talking about the orbitals is going to be the next thing we start doing um, and kind of understanding how this is all happening, tying in our knowledge of electron configurations and orbitals to best these vesper geometries. Um, and so this is a really famous graph. You see this, this particular figure shows up all over the place in chemistry and in physics. Um, and it's a really, it's kind of unique in that um, it's not a nice, neat function. It looks kind of nice and neat, but it's not anything that looks like something, a function you learned about in Alpha 2 or, or even in calculus, right? This is not a, an easy function to model with one equation because it's really basically the sum of all of the different energies um, that take that uh, are relevant to, to two atoms. Um, but basically what it is, is, is if you start with two hydrogens, an infinite distance apart, two hydrogen atoms, they each want to gain one electron to fill their valence, right? Or if you, if you put them with other non-metals, they're going to try and, and share bonds or share electrons. This is explaining why. What happens when they're an infinite distance apart, they're actually slightly attracted to each other because those wave or those orbitals that those electrons are sitting in, when you have an infinite amount of distance between them, you have two atomic orbitals that have their own normal shape. But as you start to bring them closer together, even from you know a mile away, two hydrogen atoms will have a slight attractive force that's just barely more stable than having them be totally separate atoms because their orbitals might be a long way away from each other, but those orbitals decay exponentially. They approach zero asymptotically. And so there's still a slight attractive force. And we can think of an attractive force in, on a graph like this. The attractive force is basically the slope of the line. Wherever you, if you picture taking like a ball bearing and putting it on this line, like it's going to very slowly pick up speed until it gets down in here, right? And once it's sitting down in here, it's pretty stable and it's gonna stay there. And so what happens is these hydrogen atoms approach each other because they've got that attractive force towards each other until their orbitals start to overlap with each other. And that's when we see a covalent bond forming. When you can have a certain a space in between the two atoms where electrons can be in both orbitals at the same time, being both valences at the same time. It seems like we could get these, these orbitals to overlap better if we got those, those nuclei even closer together. But why, does, why would the, the energy start going up? Why would it get less stable after a certain point? What starts happening is when you keep bringing, we're bringing the hydrogens closer and closer together, they hit a certain point that we call the bond length. We can make the orbitals overlap even more if we got them even closer, right? Mm -hmm. But the nuclei are repelling each other because they're both positive. So that's why this line basically goes up off into an infinity until you get them so close that you actually have a fusion reaction happen. And so what you really have is you have sort of this area down here where these bonds or these atoms are sitting an average distance apart. And they kind of, you can kind of think of them as being like two heavy weights that are attached with a spring. They're kind of always sort of vibrating. That ball bearing that I talked about dropping down here, it doesn't just get to the bottom and sit, right? It's gonna to get to the bottom and keep doing this, rolling back and forth. That's the same thing that happens with these nuclei. They sort of shake back and forth a little bit, which is why certain in the, the frequency of that shaking back and forth, we can actually measure by how well these atoms, these molecules absorb light of certain frequencies. So this is actually one of the ways that we can um, determine what an unknown organic compound is. We look at what wavelengths of light it absorbs certain infrared frequencies of light are going to be absorbed better by carbon hydrogen bonds compared to carbon oxygen bonds because basically you're changing the weight at the end of those springs when you do that um, which is something we spend a lot of time with in OCHEM and 
it's a, it's a pretty fun puzzle. Um, the uh, my very favorite class I've ever taken was a class called organic qualitative analysis, which was basically here's an unknown white powder. It's one of these these. I think we had about 2,000 compounds that you could have chosen from. It's one of these 2,000 compounds. Your final is to tell me what it is. Go. And it was just basically we had a week and full access to the chemistry labs to run all these tests and interpret all this. And it winds up being like this three-dimensional crossword puzzle where you get certain pieces of information over here and certain pieces of information over there. And you have to look at where they intersect and figure everything out. It's... Clearly, I, I enjoyed it because I like puzzles. Um, mine, oh, I don't know. I remember my midterm, the midterm was actually harder than final. The midterm was actually a mixture of two compounds, and you had to find a way to separate them before you could figure out what either of them was. And I got really lucky. And my my uh, friends were really upset with me because one of mine was soluble in water and the other one wasn't. And that made it really easy to separate them out. Um, and everybody else had to go through these much longer processes, and I just got really lucky. Um, so I clearly remember that part. So this is sort of one Linus Pauling's first big contribution. Linus Pauling's that guy came after all of the guys from the Solvay conference. Um, so he was doing his work in the after the Manhattan Project. So in the in the fifties and sixties, um, and uh, his and he wrote actually a really really good um, introductory chemistry textbook, but it's now out of date. Um, and so this was his way of sort of describing why, what a covalent bond is. But the problem with this model, so this is called valence bond theory, just the idea that you need the orbitals to overlap for this to happen. And if we start thinking about orbitals a little bit, and I'm not going to go too in depth here because we've, we've been talking about orbitals a lot. Um, we basically had, we had four different variables we needed to describe an electron completely, right? Principal quantum number, which was energy level. And then there was, okay, what type of orbital is, is it? Is it in um, L equals zero or L equals one? So an S orbital or a P orbital. And then within that P orbital, you had three options for where you could put it into the x, the one, the orbital goes along the x-axis, the orbital goes along the y, the orbital goes around um, around the z-axis. And as you got bigger orbitals, you got more options there, which is why the bigger orbitals hold more electrons. And then the last one was just spin, right? Spin up versus spin down. Those are the four numbers we needed to describe an electron completely. But the issue is that these just describe what's called an atomic orbital. And, and I hinted at this when we first talked about Vesper geometries. Once you make a covalent bond, you don't actually have atomic orbitals anymore. You have molecular orbitals. And it turns out that those functions that describe the shapes change shape when you start mixing them together. Math, and I mean mathematically mixing, not getting out of mixing bowl. Mathematically mixing, meaning that you take like 0.5 times this function plus 0.5 times this other function, and then you get a new function that's a combination of the first two. When you start mixing these orbitals together like that, you get different shapes. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about why we need to think about it that way. Um, if we just looked at, say, sulfur and said, okay, sulfur's got two vacancies in the P orbital. Therefore, it can make two bonds. It has these two half-filled orbitals, each of which can then share with a hydrogen. And then we get something that looks like um, dihydrogen monosulfide or hydrogen disulfide. No, sorry. Um, I can't think of what the common name is. So we'll go with the name that I thought here, which is would be dihydrogen monosulfide. Um, if you do that though, we wind up with something where, okay, here's a P orbital sharing with the hydrogen and that's 90 degrees from this hydrogen. But they were able to look at these, these bonds already at this point and say, well, that's not actually what we see. We actually see them 109.5 degrees from each other. 
So what's going on that allows that to happen? And there was some other weirdness because if you look at carbon, carbon's got a full 2s orbital and then it's got two electrons in a 2p orbital, right? Which if we just look at this model says we can only make two bonds because there's only two half filled suborbitals in carbon like this. But we, we know that carbon actually makes four bonds. Again, this is something that back when they were first discovering this line is falling already knew that carbon makes four bonds regularly and has a tetrahedral shape. So what Linus Pauling really did is he, he used this um, idea of hybridizing the orbitals, of mixing them together to sort of unify the, the mathematical theory of these atomic orbital shapes and the, the experimental data that says, but we know carbon actually makes four bonds. Effectively, what hybridization is, is rather than this is what the atomic orbitals look like, like we've been used to looking at for carbon. But if you take each of these and you take this suborbital function and this function and this function and this function and you mix them all together in a one to one to one to one ratio, you get a new shape and a new energy. Their energies just wind up being a weighted average of the, the pieces that we mix together. So instead of having a 2s orbital and three 2p boxes, we wind up with four hybridized orbitals that we call sp3. And that literally just stands for one part s, three parts p. We mix together all three of pieces of our p orbital with an s orbital. So we get a one, one part s to three parts p for an overall function that's gonna, going to give us four orbitals that are the same energy as each other that can all be halfway filled. And now we can make four bonds with this. So why would this happen? Why, like this is a weird mathematical abstraction. Why would we start mixing together these orbital functions to make them all the same? They were, they were perfectly good the way they were. Why am I, I gonna go and try and change that? Well, because now it can make four bonds and that allows it to fill its valence. If we go back to carbon, if we were trying to fill carbon's valence by making bonds, we can't fill its valence with this model. Because even if we make the two bonds, one here and one here, we then still wind up with an empty P suborbital that we can't make a bond with because it doesn't, it's not halfway filled. You can't make a covalent bond like that. So that what the hybridization does is it makes it so that all of these are the same energy and therefore they can all be halfway filled and carbon can fill its valence. And it turns out if you do that, if you actually track the map and do some vector analysis on these functions and look at how they're all arranged, if you mix an S orbital and a P, a P orbital along the X axis and a P orbital along the Y axis and a P orbital or along the Z axis, there are four different ways you can combine them. And when you mix them together, you get these four hybridized orbitals that are pointed 109.5 degrees from each other. So the math and the geometry actually backs up that tetrahedral stuff that we could get to without knowing anything about orbitals. You, you could just say, I've got four electron domains that are trying to be far apart from each other. The furthest they could be is 109.5. When you get really into the orbital math in, this, in mathematical descriptions, it also gives you a tetrahedral geometry by mixing these together, right? So, so this is the orbital hybridization is the, is the theory that unifies Orbitals work like this. Atomic orbitals have these shapes, and carbon makes four bonds. It also actually describes some other things really nicely. Like, for instance, um, do you guys know that oxygen is a gas, is magnetic? It actually has some unpaired electrons.
electrons, despite the fact that if we count up all the electrons um, in oxygen, it should be all of them paired up and all of them in nice, neat shapes and, and geometries. But it turns out if we treat, if we do the math, we wind up with two orbitals that are the same energy that have one electron each in them. So oxygen will actually respond to a magnetic field. You can do some really cool things like if you take liquid oxygen, which boils at the same temperature as liquid nitrogen, you can actually pour liquid oxygen between the poles of a magnet and watch it bend. It'll, the stream will look like normal and then it'll hit the magnetic field and it'll bend and then it'll fall to gravity. Can you just place oxygen like that as well? Can it can it displace oxygen? Yeah. Well, so it's still oxygen when it's a liquid. It's just not a, a gas. Um, in theory, I think you can actually, if it wouldn't freeze you solid, I think you could actually breathe liquid oxygen, um, because it still behaves the same way. It would just have to be really, really, really cold. All right, so. What is the practical upside to this? Why do we care this much about it? Well, the fact that it gives us our tetrahedral shape means that we can tell just based on, on the electron geometry and therefore to Lewis dot structure, we can tell which orbitals have to be mixed together to give us that shape. Anything with a tetrahedral electron geometry has to have what we call an sp3 hybridization. So basically hybridization is just another way of describing, it's another word for the same thing. Instead of saying electron geometry, we can just say sp3. But what do we get if it's not, if it's not a tetrahedral shape? Well, if we look at the lone pairs, if we look at lone pairs, the lone pairs still need to be pushed away from everything else. So the lone pairs, even though they're not forming a bond, they still have a hybridized orbital because that's what allows those vesper geometries to happen the way that is the most stable. And so even though we would say, okay, well, if we're looking at, at NH3 at ammonia, it only has three bonds, but it's still more stable to make these sp3 hybridized orbitals in order to get that tetrahedral geometry and not have them be stuck in a trigonal planar geometry with an extra p orbital up and down. So we get into different levels of hybridization when we start looking at things that only have three electron domains. If you only have three electron domains, you don't need all four of those orbitals, right? You only need three of those orbitals to be mixed together. And so instead of taking, instead of taking all of these and mixing them together, we can actually get these bonds to be a little bit more stable if we leave that one out. Don't hybridize that one. And instead just mix together 2S and the 2P. So instead of having an sp3 hybridization, we get sp2, and then we have a leftover p orbital that's all by itself. And the reason this is helpful is because that's how you make a pi bond. Remember how I talked about sigma bond versus pi bond very briefly and said, okay, well, double bonds are not really two of the same thing. There's a regular bond, and then there's this thing that goes above and below that. Does that ring any bells? Maybe I did that in the lab instead. If we think about um, a carbon and an oxygen, the carbon's orbital can look like this, and the oxygen's orbital can look like this to make a bond between them. So their bond is that area where both of those orbitals overlap. If you're trying to make a double bond, though, it can't go in the same physical space. This physical space is already taken up. So what happens instead, and actually let me change colors. What happens instead is you leave one orbital unhybridized that just looks like a regular P orbital still, or piece of a P orbital. And if the oxygen also has that, that's a double bond, 
is actually going to be made of these two unhybrid or these yeah these two unhybridized p orbitals overlapping sort of around this middle section so when you have a double bond and remember so the, the terminology used is this type of bond when you have a double bond it's really these unhybridized p orbitals that we call a pi bond when they mix together and this regular bond or single bond is a sigma bond. Right, so everything that has a sink that has a bond has a sigma bond, but if you need to make a double bond, you can't put it in the same spot. You have to have an unhybridized P orbital to do that. So when you have three electron domains instead of instead of um, four electron domains, it's because you need to use this unhybridized p orbital to make a pi bond so anytime you have a double bond you're not going to include both of the orbitals in your hybridization so something that has that has three electron domains only has a hybridization that has three pieces to it so sp2 one part s to two parts p and then it has that leftover p orbital that allows it to make a double bond. Which, again, is really abstract. It's weird. It's new vocabulary we're talking about now. But let me ask you a question. What happens if you need to make two double bonds? Or sorry, or two pi bonds? If you need to make a triple bond or two double bonds? I erased that, that diagram. So we had our sigma bond here in the middle. And then we have our pi bond that's made up of the unhybridized p orbitals sort of overlapping with each other. Well, carbon monoxide is actually a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen. So where does that next bond come from? Kind of up and up. We can't really remember we have three dimensions to work with, right? We could do the exact same thing that we did here, except into the board and out of the board, right? So, in order to do that, though, so then we would have something that looks like something looks like this where these are the yellow and the blue are perpendicular to each other. They're 90 degrees to each other. What is that gonna to do to our hybridization? We went from sp3, when we could make a tetrahedral shape, when we could make four single bonds or four electron domains. Then we were, when we had to leave one of those p orbitals out so that we could make the first pi bonds, it became sp2. So what is it going to be when we have to leave two of the pi bonds out? We drop another p, right? So now instead of now we have let's actually let's color code this properly. And we have to leave one of the orbitals out to make the perpendicular bond. We have to leave another one of the orbitals out to make the up and down pi bonds. So now we only have we've got the two at we got an S orbital and one of the P orbitals and that can get hybridized together. These can get hybridized. So instead of having SP3 would be when we have all three pieces of the P. SP2 is when we have two pieces of the P orbital. What is it when we just have one of each? SP. Just SP. So basically, and where I'm where I'm trying to go with this is just. The idea that um, the number of electron domains translates one to one with hybridization. If you have something that's linear, it has to be SP hybridization. That's the only way you can mix these together to get something where those bonds are 
are 180 degrees from each other. If something is trigonal planar electron geometry, it's always sp2. If something is tetrahedral, it's always sp3. And what happens if you go past that? That gets us up to making four bonds, right? Four electron domains. What has to be true for us to be able to break the octet rule? Has to be but below the second level, right? Because what do we get when we go to the third row of the periodic table? The orbital. So now instead of just only having, instead of only having four pieces to work with, if we have a d orbital we can mix in, we can get even more ways we can arrange them. Right? So anything that goes past this, if we had a trigonal bipyramidal shape. That's five objects taking up space around this anonymous metal. So what would the hybridization have to be? SP, how many pieces of the P? All three of them, right? So we have five pieces total. Three of them are gonna be from the P orbital. And then we have to add one D piece in that. That gives us a total of five electron domains, one from the S, three from the P, and one from the D. So what would an octahedral look like? We have six electron domains. SP3, D2. So basically, this is the mathematical way of describing what the Vesper lab was all about in terms of trying to get these right shapes so that you can get as many things together as possible. This is a pretty common way of describing it because it's actually faster than trying to describe a geometric shape and it's closer to what the physics actually does. You're literally mixing together atomic orbitals in a way that allows you to make more bonds and lower the overall energy. None of this applies to atoms. This only applies when you start mixing atomic orbitals. If you have an atom by itself, it just has a regular sp, s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, like we've been talking about. Um, so here's just some figures that describe, and actually this one's not accurate. These should be smaller if it's hybridized orbitals mixing together. Um, so I need to, but I haven't found any better figures. But here's just a, a better drawing of what a carbon oxygen pi bond would look like. So this would be for formaldehyde. We have a carbon here that has three electron domains, an oxygen that has three electron domains. It's just not showing the lone pairs on either side. And each hydrogen only has an S orbital. So the hydrogen orbitals don't really get hybridized like this because it only has an S orbital to work with. So that means that we can just look at this and we can say, okay, well, if this carbon has three hybridized orbital and one unhybridized P orbital, it's an sp2 carbon. So again, going back to the, a lot of times we're gonna have a mixture of different molecular geometries in the same molecule. This gives us a handy way of describing, oh, that carbon's sp2, that carbon's sp3 is a faster way and more descriptive of what the orbitals are doing. Um, rather than just saying the tetrahedral carbon or the trigonal planar carbon, um, it actually removes a lot of that memorization that, that you get for all those names and geometries. If you can get good at using the hybridization instead. So they have like different strengths. They do. So the strength of a bond is related to how much you can get the two orbitals to overlap. And so if you have a, a pi bond is not never going to be as stable as a sigma bond. Because a sigma bond is really easy to get them these orbitals directly on top of each other, you get a lot of overlap. But these pi bonds, we kind of like smear them out so that they look like they're overlapping a little bit. They're not overlapping nearly as well 
And so the sigma bonds are stronger. It's more favorable to have sigma bonds generally than it is to have, have pi bonds. And, that, and then that, that starts getting into how do we predict what products are going to be in something like we talk about this a lot in OEM because pi bonds breaking to make more sigma bonds is one of the main reactions that we talk about. We talk a lot about how pi bonds react and why sigma bonds don't because the sigma bonds are more stable as they have already. All right, let's see. We'll pick up with polarity um, the other day, but let's so let's we got six minutes left. Start by Lewis, drawing Lewis dot structures and figure out what the hybridization is on on um, the central atom for each of these. So for CH4, four electron domains. So what, and really all you have to do is start counting from the lowest energy at the orbital until you get to enough electron domains. We need four electron domains, which means we need four hybridized orbitals. So what's the lowest energy type of orbital? S. S, and what's the next lowest type? P. And how many pieces can a p orbital have? Three. three. It's sp three, which means it's also tetrahedral. Right? It tells us that as well. The fact that it's sp three means, by definition, it's tetrahedral electron geometry. Right. So really. Counting electron domains, hybridization, and electron geometry are all different ways of saying the exact same thing. But you have to start by making your Lewis dot structure. So going, starting by counting electron domains to get to those others is usually the best way to do it. How about for H2O? There's our Lewis dot structure, right? It should look familiar. Eight electrons. How many electron domains taking up space? Four, which means we still need to have four electron or we have still need to have four orbitals overlapped. So despite the fact that it's bent rather than tetrahedral, the molecular geometry can be different, but they're both tetrahedral electron geometries, which means they're both going to be sp3. Even though oxygen is not sharing those electrons, they're still taking up space, right? And so because those electrons push each other away, in fact, that as soon as we start making bonds, that allows these orbitals to mix together and they're not stuck being 90 degrees to each other. This allows the two lone pairs to be further apart from each other by hybridizing. All right, how about ALCL3? What is that? That Lewis dot structure is going to look. Something like this. And if we draw it just like this, then we'd actually don't have a full valence around the aluminum, even though that makes all the formal charges zero. So we could draw it with a double bond between one of the carbons or one, sorry, one of the chlorines. Only two, three electron groups, right? Three electron domains. 
So that for that aluminum, I mean. So the aluminum's hybridization would have to be. You said it. Sp two. We only need three pieces. So we start with the S and then we add higher energy orbitals until we get to the right number of pieces. And it doesn't matter whether you draw that as a double bond or a lone pair. Also, the aluminum is still SP2 either way. How about SF4? We just did that one, right? So everybody should remember that it's trigonal bipyramidal. Everybody memorizes these, right? Since it's on the on the test, just take me at my word, and then we can work through the process if you if you want to in the office hours. How many electron domains do we have? Five. So we need an S. We need all of the pieces of the P, right? So that's three D one. We just leave it off. We just say SP three P. But it wouldn't really be wrong if you wanted to write it like that to remind yourself what that's doing. And anything octahedral is going to be SP three D two. We just have to add one more piece of the D orbital. So let's let's talk about the fluorines have their own hybridization. The fluorines each have four electron domains, right? Which means each of the fluorines is sp3, and the sulfur is sp3d. So just like we talked, started out talking about how every atom can have its own molecular geometry or electron geometry, every atom can have its own hybridization as well, right? And you would just look at for this fluorine, four electron groups means sp3. For this sulfur, five electron groups means sp3d. All right. Good job. Good job on the test. Um, be a short quiz over the weekend just on this. I'm going to give you a couple more of these. I don't, you know, you can drop over stop structures. It'll probably be like a half an hour tops. Okay, I'll put it up. Hold that thought, please. Please turn on the report.